with us. Lift your hands all over this place. Welcome to Central Christian Academy. We're glad you're with us for what has been a marvelous week. What a great way to start out 2015. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the ease that you've done it with. We love you. We thank you for your hand resting on our lives to do exploits. We take you at your word. They that know their God shall become strong and do exploits. Father, as you empower us, may you empower us to see the greatest things done in the kingdom of God that we've ever seen this year. Thank you for what you've done in Africa. Thank you for what you've done in Asia. Thank you for what you've done all through South and Central America. But don't leave us out. Move through us and let us see a mighty move of God uh, even stronger. Let it just grow all through this county, all through the state of Pennsylvania. I pray for the pastors watching online that as they watch, you would give them a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost and empower them to do something great in their churches you've called them to. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen. Give the Lord one more hand clap. You may be seated. I want you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 9. We continue on fasting and prayer. Mark the ninth chapter. I've been spending during these meetings probably, uh, what, two hours a day in the vehicle. And a lot of you do about the same thing. That's time that doesn't have to be wasted time. And now with all the materials there are, uh, you can use that as a, a time of spiritual investment. Christian music's great. It's better than secular music, but nothing empowers like the Word of God. So we made that 24-hour radio station. I want to remind you about it again, RevivalTodayRadio.com. And then uh, if you look on our website, we have a number you can dial. So if you don't want to use your data or if you're having trouble getting it to load, you can actually just dial the number and have it play uh, through the phone call and have it play on the Bluetooth on your speakers. So either way, you're covered. And that way, how many of you have enjoyed the preaching? I know you want to come back if you hated it. And uh, that way you can have it getting preached into you all the time. So then, you, you know what I mean? It, it makes it from a, an annoyance of having to drive from Washington up to, you know, wherever, Carnegie or wherever you're headed, to that can be time where you're having the Word of God deposited into your spirit. So that's RevivalTodayRadio.com. And then uh, in, the, in the back, we have, this is our Revival Today Air Force brochure. It says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it giveth light to all. That tells about our television ministry. I'm going to read it tonight. We had a testimony from uh, Pittsburgh of a teenager that was watching last night. And he said, I woke, I woke up, I set my alarm and woke up to watch for school closings on ABC and your show was on. And I gave my life to the Lord. And he said, I'd like to be a preacher like you. So can you tell me any schools I can go to where I can, I mean, you, that makes that is great to see listen to see everything God did last night then go to sleep and have and then wake up and there's more impact and that's only the, the beginning the best I mean we're, we're gonna give the devil a hard time all year long can you say amen, amen. if you'd like to stand with us uh, in our television ministry that would uh, give you the information uh, we call the people that do revival today Air Force eighty four dollars a month which I think is a good good amount because it's uh, a little less than what people spend on cable and internet anyway. And instead of paying for cable, you are giving money to see that the gospel's preached on cable. So anyway, that's back there. If you'd like to be a part of that, I'd strongly recommend it to get your hand involved in getting the gospel to people. So that's on the back table, and uh, I'm glad you're here. How many of you are ready for Jesus to do a, an even greater work in your life today? Mark, the, and, and in case you're new to the, new to the revival, um, Pastor Getchell has felt the leading of God to extend the meeting through Friday. So, uh, and I'm going to keep the, the day services going as well because they're good. I mean, you know, if you're fasting and praying, which I recommend you to do to start the and pray is to sit home. It, it's good to be in the house of God twice a day fasting and praying because uh, you don't get as hungry. If you're sitting around bored, that's the worst way to do it. I'll tell you this, too. There's a second kind of fast, speaking of Africa, that they do in Africa that I would strongly recommend. I prefer it to the Daniel fast if you're going to do that. I, and there's people watching online, so I, I do this for this reason, too. You know, you announce a 21-day fast to start the year. Let's be honest. Your average person that works a job is not going to total fast 21 days. 
because you work a factory job, whatever. So what they end up doing is not doing the fast and then feeling bad about it. You just feel guilty. So this kind of fast I'm going to give you, I prefer it to the Daniel fast because the Daniel fast is no meat. You have to remember, Daniel was not on that fast for 21 days. Daniel was on that fast for as long as he needed to be on it until he got his answer, and his answer came on the 21st day. So Daniel's fast was a fast that's doable as a lifestyle. But in these short bursts, uh, you know, they say no meats, no sweets, no breads. So what do you end up doing? You end up having people walk around with a family-sized bag of Tostitos chips and a gallon of iced tea and, you know, gain weight on the fast. You know, you, you can eat yourself full on the Daniel fast. You can gain weight on the Daniel fast. And that's what most Americans do. So I don't, I'm not a big fan of what the Daniel fast has turned into. I mean, I've seen people instagram what they're eating on the daniel fast it's like a family-sized salad bowl with ranch dressing you're not fasting uh what the american church calls fasting the third world church calls eating but what they do in africa and i like this fast midnight to 6 p.m because midnight to 6 p.m trust me you will feel the effect of the fast however that's something that when you hear it you don't, now, if I say, we're all going to fast 21 days, you think, good Lord, I don't know if I can do it. Midnight to 6 sounds challenging, but that's doable. And you might not think it is, and I'm telling you, it's doable. You know, I don't know, 3 p.m., stick it out three more hours. You will not die, I promise you. And if you do, uh, you're dead. But, <laughs> so arguments are, no, you're, you're not going to die missing midnight to 6. So fast, try that for 21 days. You, midnight to six, six to midnight, eat all you want. You'll find out. People say, man, uh, if, but if you can eat 6 p.m. to midnight, you can really pig out. No, you'll find out you have a stomach that's limited in what it can hold. And then you'll also find out as you get deeper into the fast. It was amazing. When we did the 100-day fast with the Redeemed Christian Church of God last year, um, my nephew, it made me laugh because the first few days of the fast, at 6 p.m., we could break it. 5.15 he would start cooking so that the meal would be ready promptly at 6. <laughs> However, when we got into late January and into February, I looked up, I was home one day and I looked upstairs and he was playing video games. And I said, have you eaten yet? He said, no. I said, you know, it's quarter to eight. He said, oh, is it? I'll be down a little bit. And then finish whatever he was doing upstairs, came down and ate around. You'll find you conquer your appetite. I can always tell when I'm around people who have fasted and haven't fasted. Now, you, I'll tell you who's off the hook on a fast. I never fasted until I was 18, or I think, in Bible school. So you're growing. Eat up. Uh, nursing mothers, pregnant women are off the hook. Dr. Attaboy even lets people 70 and older off the hook, though he does it himself. But I would say, especially if you're my age, 35, 34, in your 20s, see, the strongest urge of the flesh is to eat. So if you can learn to conquer that, you can, you can conquer every other thing that, that's, that's a part of the flesh. How did man fall? Through eating. How did Esau lose his blessing? Hunger. Learn to conquer that. When I'm around people, and I know they haven't fasted because they'll, they'll say, when's dinner ready? You know, we'll go on a missions trip. When, when, when's the meal going to be ready? We, we, I haven't eaten since lunch. You can tell. Their stomach rules them. But people that fast, you basically... Your stomach knows to keep its mouth shut after a while. It just, it'll make gentle suggestions to you. I'm hungry when you get around to it. If not, no. Dominion over your flesh. And that's the key to living a victorious Christian life. Putting the spirit in dominion over the flesh. So I, I challenge you as I preach on this and teach on it, do it. You know, if you want to do three days, if you're not in pulpit ministry, I don't think you ever have to fast longer than three days, personally. If you would do consistent short fasts are better than fasting for 21 days one time and then not doing another one for three years. Now, three days doesn't seem long. It's not. But if you were to do three days a month, you'll have done a tithe of the whole year at the end of the year, and that's something. Or you could do like we're talking. 21 days, midnight to 6 to start, and then do three days every month since. Uh, uh, I'm doing one myself. I'm doing a total fast because I'm a minister. You know, I have to. I'm going to read to you why. You have people start coming to your meetings. Hey, my aunt has stage 4 cancer. Could you pray for her? Well, you know, I need to be in a place, and I can do it. I'm not working for somebody at a cubicle. 
You can't be coming into a steel factory job, you know, like this, and not being able to carry anything. So do, you don't have to do more than three days. And I like midnight to six because you're going to feel it. A lot of you wake up at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. To not eat from then till 6 p.m. is something. And, and drink water. You can have tea, uh, coffee, you know, don't have milkshakes. I hear people say, don't anything you can put in a blender. No, it's a fast. If you're heavier after the fast, you didn't fast. And I've mentioned it before, and I'm not saying it to, 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 for you to put me on a pedestal. But I, I hope me preaching these two times a day on a total fast shows you, you won't die. Look at last night. I spoke, I, I had the mic for about two hours and ten minutes and laid hands on everybody in the building. They didn't have to carry me to my car. I went out to my vehicle singing. Uh, singing an old chorus I, I, I grew up on. It was running through my spirit. Don't let, you, don't let your, your stomach be your God. I, I, I can't go longer than four hours without... Yes, you can. They do it all over the world. That's why overseas they have an easier time fasting because a lot of them don't eat anyway. There's no food. You don't die. One thing after traveling and preaching overseas that you notice when you come to this country, there's just food everywhere. You don't even have to know where a restaurant is. Just pull off any exit and there's like nine restaurants. People love to eat, and there's nothing wrong with it. Let me tell you this too as a preacher. You don't have to be dumb about being spiritual. I don't fast at Christmas time. I don't fast at Thanksgiving and sit around the table with my family. Would you like any turkey, Jonathan? No. Souls are going to hell. <laughs> Nobody likes being around people like that. Can you say amen? amen? And it's not scriptural to be like that. The Bible says, rejoice with those that rejoice, mourn with those that mourn. And so you're not supposed to be the black cloud that walks into a room. I'm a happy guy. I was so happy in school, you can ask Mrs. Carter, it got me many trips out of class. It said on the back of almost all my report cards from first grade on, very respectful, laughs too much. And I've never stopped. I don't fast at Christmas time. As much as God instituted f uh, fast, he instituted feasts. So at Christmas time, we party. Thanksgiving time, I eat till I need to put on different pants. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. In fact, especially knowing I'm going to start in January, I eat, I eat even when I'm not hungry going into it. But then there's a time to set yourself aside in fasting and prayer to attain unto the power of God. Can you say amen? Why? Mark chapter 9, verse 14. Midnight to 6 p.m. My wife's on that. Her sister's on that. I believe my brother-in-law, Abel, that's a construction worker, is on that one. I think that's a doable fast. And, and you know it's doable because you have a, 3 million people doing it right now in Nigeria. They're not dying left and right. And in and, and Ghana and, uh, you know, all through South Korea and the rest of Asia. It's really us. If you want to see the power of God move in your life, you have to be spiritual. The battle we are facing is not a natural battle, it's a supernatural battle. So you have to do your battle in the supernatural realm. And when you do, you can win the battle before it even begins in fasting and prayer. One time, I, uh, just to tell you how you can win the battle before it even begins, let me tell you the blessings that come from praying. I was in Maui, where we have two churches, and uh, I had felt the Lord deal with me to increase my prayer time. So I wasn't on a fast, but I was praying. So what I did was I found where a Starbucks was, 30 minutes from my hotel, walking distance. And, you know, it's 85 degrees with a, with a 20 mile an hour wind. So uh, it's a nice walk. And so I mapped out 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back. That way I didn't have to keep track of how long I had prayed. I knew when I got to the Starbucks, it had been 30 minutes. I'd get a coconut latte to give me a little energy to walk back and then drink it while praying on the way back. And in Maui, everybody's high on marijuana mumbling to themselves. So what, what's one more person mumbling to themselves? The only difference is I had my hands up. So anyway, and you know, if you don't like it, go walk on another sidewalk. Amen. But uh, <laughs> like I was walking around my neighborhood in Oakdale at 2 in the morning back in the summertime praying. I like to pray late at night because nobody calls. You can't get distracted. There's nothing to do anyway. So uh, I, uh, I'm walking around my neighborhood with my hands up praying and a police car pulled up to me. He said, what are you doing? 
I said, I'm praying. What does it look like I'm doing? And he went like that. I went to speak in tongues, and then he drove off. When you speak in tongues, people give you plenty of room. They don't want to know anything else. And so I'm walking down the sidewalk and uh, praying. And I had made a list of things I wanted to pray about and uh, to be prepared. So I'm going through them, praying for the ministry, praying for the churches in Hawaii. I mean, think of it. We prayed that God would give us permanent property in Hawaii. We had two different towns contact us to turn their buildings over to us. One of the churches had a homosexual on the board that was adamantly opposed to them turning the church over to our ministry. He has a house in California that he rents out. And when he made the big stink about not turning the, the church over, the sewage in his house backed up. And when I say backed up, I mean it covered the whole first floor in sewage, raw sewage, so that he had to resign from the board, move back to California, find another home out of his own pocket for the renter to live in, and then oversee the cleanup of the house himself. God has a sense of humor. You want to stop what I'm doing? Then I will fill your house with poo-poo. That's what God did. And so, Key and I turned their church over to us, and then Hana turned that beautiful church that's a historic mark, you know, built in the uh, mid-1800s. And we, just by prayer, no gimmicks, no pressing, no lobbying anybody, just pray. And they, con they would never even grant us a meeting to meet with them about leasing the church. Then they call us, we'd like you to have the church. And actually all of the people on that board, once that happened to that guy, the town saw it as, as an act of God. And, and now, now everybody like, no, you can have the church. We, we don't want to be cleaning up number two for the rest of the year. It's all yours. Can you say amen? amen. So I, I prayed for stuff like that. Well, then I get to the one, since my wife had just had my daughter Camila, she had stayed home and didn't go to Hawaii with me. I, you know, it's a 13-hour flight with, with a newborn. So I, uh, she stayed home. So I had her on the prayer list. Father... Bless my wife today. May she feel your hand touch her. May she feel your spirit in, in the room that she's in today in the house. In Jesus' name. And prayed for my daughter separately. But at this point, I'm praying for my wife. So I said the little I had to say in English. The Bible says when you pray, don't pray like the, the heathen do. That think they're heard by their multitude of words. Do you know God's an intelligent God? When you pray, you look at the prayer that Elijah called fire down from heaven with. If you pray it out, it takes about 45 seconds. The Bible says Jesus does not, Jesus said God doesn't like to hear babbling. Like when I went to Bible school, the guy that led the prayer meeting, I came at 6 a.m. like they said. He said, all right, we're going to pray. Let's join hands. Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. You know, God's up in heaven saying, what are you doing? God's not a stupid God. He's an intelligent God. You imagine if I talk to my wife that way? A dollar, 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 a dollar. I thank you that you're such a good cook, 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 cook. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love. I mean, they put they put you in the mental institution. Everybody say this: God is an intelligent God. You look now. A prayer that called fire down from heaven just went like this: God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's worship. That's calling into remembrance everything he did for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I thank you that you are God. Prove this day that there is still a God in Israel. And bring these people back to yourself and answer by fire. And fire, fire, fire. I mean, you talk about, just speak. So, Father, bless my wife today. See, the problem is why people can't pray long. They don't prepare. Prepare out like 20 things you want to pray about. Say, I don't know if I could think of 20. You can. Think. Even if it's over the course of days, employees at your business, accounts that you need, vehicle, mortgage payment, you can think of 20 things. Then get scriptures on them. Take the scriptures to the Lord. Like I was talking about yesterday, God said in Isaiah, present your strong reasons before me. So, Lord, bless my wife wherever she is. Let her feel your hand. Let her feel your presence. Let her not have any taste of sickness or disease while I'm on the road here. Keep her in your health. For you said you'd keep sickness and disease out of our midst. So what does that take? Forty some seconds. So then what do I do? Before I go to the next point, the Bible says pray always. What will I do then? Paul said, I will pray both in the language I understand and I will pray in the spirit. So after I finish in English, the Bible says you do not know what you should pray for nor how you should pray. But the spirit who knows all things prays through us with groanings and utterances that can't be said in words. Can you say amen? amen? So think of it. If God knows the end from the beginning, 
then when you pray in the Spirit, you're praying things that you don't even know about. So that's what I did. This is where it became real to me. So I start in tongues. Romo tashte babra akapasto bobra. Pray in tongues for a little while. When I get done, or I'm not even done, I feel it come out of my spirit. See, when you pray in tongues, then it'll trigger something for, to say in English. God will, God will bring your mind to something. Well, God didn't even bring my mind to this. As I'm praying in tongues, I blurt out. Any tumor or growth in my wife's breast, I curse it now in Jesus' name. When I said that, it surprised me. Because at that time, my wife was 28 years old. She's not even, and this is what I thought saying it. My wife's not even at the age that these fearful medical people even tell you to get checked for breast cancer or, or, or lumps in the breast. So I thought that was strange. Looked at my watch, which I'm a great one to do, and it was 10.40 a.m., Hawaiian time, which made it, uh, I think at that time, 3.40 p.m. Eastern time. Kept praying. Never gave another thought. Adalis was busy that day. I was busy that day. So when she called me before she went to sleep, uh, it was late at night. We talked for a little bit. At the end of the phone call, my wife said, one more thing, Jonathan. I know you have a lot to do over there. And, and my, my wife almost never asked me for prayer. She prays, so she takes care of her own business. But she said, uh, I know I don't ask you for this kind of stuff much, but I want, if you would, pray for me. I said, sure, what do you want me to pray about? She said, when I was taking a shower today, I found a lump in my breast and it's fairly sizable. I said, okay, I'll pray. Then I thought for a second. I said, wait a minute. See, I already did my praying. I don't have to pray again. I said, uh, wait a minute. What time did you take your shower? She said, well, my, my uh, Camila was being rowdy, you know, and, and wouldn't go to sleep. So it was about 3.30, 3.45 before I could take my shower. Well, I, I prayed at, uh, oh no, a six-hour difference. So I prayed at 10, 10.40. I prayed at 4.40 an hour after that. I thought, no. I said, I already prayed about it. I said, check your breast now. It's quiet on the phone. So I thought I lost signal. There's mountains all through Maui, and the, the signal drops out. I said, Adalis, are you there? No sound. A dollars? Then I heard, <laughs> it's gone. Do you know why it was gone? Because God knows the end from the beginning. Now, what attack did the enemy have with that? To, for my wife to lose her breast? For the cancer to spread and metastasize through her body? For me to be standing here two years later, having had a wife and having a story about, I don't know. No. In prayer, God knows what the enemy has planned before he ever does it. And when you pray, God will upend the, the, the attack of the enemy that you don't even know he has. You can win the battle before the battle ever begins in Jesus' name. Lift your hands all over this place. I prophesy in the name of Jesus that in this meeting today, every plan that the enemy has against your life in 2015, before the battle even begins, God will will destroy his work today in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, clap those hands and shout unto the Most High God. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I know you heard me say Mark 9, but I'm calling a Peyton Manning audible at the line. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Omaha, Omaha. Red 40, 2 Chronicles 20. You know, when I first started preaching and, and that would happen, they call that when you're preaching rabbit trails. That like you're getting off topic. But what I learned was actually I had something prepared. And when I'd start swinging the other way, <laughs> I was actually getting on topic. Where I learned it was in um, Millersburg, Pennsylvania. If you've never been there, there's really no reason to go. Uh, there's nothing there. It's a nice place, but you know, you can stare at a field anywhere. Amen? So I'm there, and there's a, I'm preaching on something totally different. I mean, I'm not even talking about healing. I go stand about right here as I'm preaching, and out of like left field, this pops out of me. Our God can do anything. They're just all standing at me. I said, uh, I don't care if a team of physicians, I'm talking like this standing here. 
I don't care if a team of physicians from Johns Hopkins University stood in front of you and told you you're going to die. If God says you'll live, then you'll live. Now, when I said that, I thought, what in the world did you say Johns Hopkins University for? That's in Baltimore, Maryland. You're in Millersburg, Pennsylvania. Nobody for, you should have used an example of a hospital that was close by. So I even paused for a minute and thought, what in the world am I talking about? And then went back into the message. I found out that a girl got saved in the morning, brought her father, who didn't believe in God, that night. And he was sitting in the second row right there. You know, I don't know any of the people. And when I stopped and said that, he had cancer. They told him, they took him from the local hospital and sent him down to Johns Hopkins. And a team of doctors that week had came in with his results and stood in front of him and said, there's nothing we can do, you're going to die. And they said his face went white after I said that because he knew his daughter didn't go to that church. She had just gone that morning herself and gotten saved. And then when he came and I said that, he came forward, gave his life to the Lord, and we prayed for him. I don't know what happened after that because I don't think they ever had me back at that church, uh, which doesn't put them in any elite company. Many places have never had me back. Uh, but, but uh, you know, the daughter was just awestruck. The pastor's wife was awestruck. She said, ha, you know, there's a God. Can you say amen? amen? And I know, it's like, whatever I would have preached on, who knows if he would have... You can't convince people mentally, but when something like that happens, it lets them know there's a God that sees everything. Let there be a move of the Holy Ghost in this church this year that convicts the hearts of everyone that comes in that there's a God that sees everything. There is a God who sees everything. If you believe it, can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles. Let me tell you another story. <laughs> this is from Ohio. Canfield, Ohio. Also, if you don't have any pressing business uh, in Canfield, Ohio, really no reason to go. But there's a nice water tower there that says Canfield on it. Other than that, basically just fields. You can see I'm not going to get a second job on the Canfield Tourism Board or Millersburg. I went out there and I came right when service starts. So, like I do. So anyway, uh, I saw the power of God touch a woman that was sitting about like where you're sitting. It came on her. I said, stand up, lady. Well, little do I know, they had wheeled her in and sat her in the chair and then wheeled her wheelchair out. So when I said, stand up, she got this startled look on her face. I thought it was because like she was from some church that wasn't used to Pentecost. And so I said, no, 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 don't be afraid. I said, I'm not going to hurt you. Just stand up. Well, she's looking at me because she's crippled. She had Parkinson's disease. Bad, like last stages of it. So she, she, I said, go ahead. It's not going to hurt you. Stand up. So she like, gets up, which people started clapping. I thought they were like encouraging her to stand up. I'm like wondering, what's with these people? Just stand up already. And then I said, uh, step into the aisle. She stepped into the aisle. And I, I laid hands on her. I said, the power of God's all over you. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. And before I said be filled with the Holy Ghost, there's a guy sitting next to her, old guy. He was crying. So I thought he's spiritual, you know. So I said, stand up and stand behind her. I'm going to put you in the ministry real quick to catch her. And so I laid hands on her. He caught her. But then he went out under the power. <laughs> now, when I finished, I found, first of all, that husband had never been to church. The wife was saved. When he saw his wife stand up and walk out into the aisle, that's why he was crying. And then when she got baptized in the Holy Spirit, he immediately got filled with the Holy Spirit. So sometime between uh, me saying that, I guess Jesus came into his heart. I guess we'll have to look over the instant replay when we get to heaven on, on the order of it. They both go down. He got saved that, that night. He actually came to go see me in, in Washington when I spoke at the hotel there. Smiling, man. So he's saved. She went out under the power. Now when I look up, now the power of God's on this other girl. 16 years old, nice dress, thought she was a church girl. And so I said, stand up, young lady. Come up here. She comes up crying. I said, lift your hands. I said, now, just said what I felt my spirit to say. I'm not going to tell you that you're called into the ministry. You're going to have to hear God tell you that for yourself. But I will tell you that you've always had a desire to help people. And today you've seen that if you'll let God fill you with his power, you can really help people like you saw happen to that woman. Lift your hands. And when I prayed, she went out under the power speaking in tongues. All of the youth group was like this. So I thought, 
you know, they must be some backslidden Pentecostal church where they've never seen anybody get filled with the Holy Ghost in 20 years. And so that's why they're having that reaction. A boy comes up to me at the end of the meeting and says, Brother Jonathan, that girl that you called out, we invited her again and again to come from the high school, and she finally agreed to come. She's president of the Atheist Club, and she agreed to come just to check it out to take notes. You think how crazy that is to call out the atheist and say, now I'm not going to tell you you're called into the ministry. You're going to have to hear God that. Just, just skip all the steps. You're going to Bible school whether you want to or not. I'm just going to tell you right now. And what happened was, she had come early and saw that woman get wheeled in and saw how the pew. And when she stood up and watched, that's why when, when I looked over, she was just awestruck with tears when she saw the power of God. And then it opened her heart. Now, I think sometimes, what if, that's why I don't like talking to people much before the meetings. Because what if somebody told me, hey, we're bringing the president of the Atheist Club tonight. You know what I probably would have done? I probably would have ditched that sermon and got out some apologetic sermon and say, I know they teach this in the high school, but we can prove from science. And it would have just been, okay, you have your opinion and you can back it up, but I don't agree. But the Spirit of God is what we need to do a work. And you notice, you know, this is what I do when I'm preaching. So you notice the, 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 the flow that God has us on this morning. That there are things that can be done in the Spirit that would not be done otherwise. Whether it was the, the guy with cancer, my wife with the growth on her breast, that atheist. You know, at the end of the service, that woman stayed on the ground. That's God's operating table. If a, if a surgeon can put somebody out and let them lay down, why can't God put somebody out for a while and do a work? When she got up, she was so happy. I said, You're, and they had a, a, an incline like this on, this on the center aisle. I said, you can walk. Yep. I said, well, let, let, let's do it. You know, and I didn't do this as a show. Everybody had gone home. I said, bring me your, your, somebody bring me your wheelchair. And I was tired from preaching. I sat in her wheelchair. I said, push me out to the car. <laughs> and she walked up the aisle. Sm like in disbelief that she now was the one pushing somebody in a wheelchair. I prophesy in the name of Jesus, there'll be people here, there'll be people the rest of this week that you used to be the one everybody had to pray for and help, and by the end of this week, you're going to be the one that's helping other people because of the power of God. If you know that's you, one more time, clap those hands and shout unto the Most High God. <laughs> Hallelujah! Second Chronicles 20. After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Meunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? And begged and noticed this was, this was a real problem. Faith does not deny problems. Faith deals with problems. That woman that had Parkinson's, I didn't say, no, no, you don't have Parkinson's. Just keep saying you don't have Parkinson's. No. You say, be healed in Jesus' name. So you don't, I'm not saying don't say, well, I don't have cancer, I don't have cancer. You say the opposite. Because you do. Jesus didn't die for imaginary diseases. Died for real ones. But what do you do? Do you repeat what the doctor said? Do you repeat facts? Or do you lift your hands and by faith say, Whose report will I believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. In Jesus' name, I declare I am healed. In America, you have Christians that tell their pastor what the doctor says. There needs to be a new breed who tells the doctor what their pastor said. Well, we found this. No, that's impossible. The Bible says Jesus bore all my infirmities. Not Jesus will take. He took. Sister Carter, help me out. Took. Future tense, present tense, or past tense? Took is past tense. If somebody took something, they don't have to retake it. When Jesus took 39 stripes on his back, you understand, Jesus wasn't just sent out to the wolves. Do whatever you want with him. Everything he did on the way to the cross and on the cross had a redemptive purpose. He was nailed to the cross 
for our sin. But when before they put him there, when they punched him in the face over and over again, he was beaten, Isaiah 53, for our peace. I refuse to not have peace. Paul said, maintain peace, supernatural peace. Don't give it up. I refuse to not have peace. I have people marked in my phone as crazy lady. Do not answer. Because somehow they got my number, and when they call, they unsettle everything. They always have something negative to say. I don't answer. Call somebody else. I don't let my life be determined by somebody who just wants to call me on the phone in the morning. Just because you're in a panic doesn't mean I have to be in a panic. Can you say amen? You don't start your day with, 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 by who calls on the phone. You, that's why it's good to start your day in prayer. Get the, I said that's why it's good to start your day in prayer. Early in the morning will I rise and seek thee. So you have your direction from God rather than just running around like a chicken all day. Well, so-and-so called, I need to go. No, get your direction from God and don't let anyone disturb your peace. He was beaten for our peace. So God didn't just let Roman soldiers punch him in the face over and over again. When Jesus had that done to him, he was taking what the devil wanted to give to me so that instead I can have his peace. For peace I give unto thee. That's how, how it was earned. And by his stripes... We are healed. When they tied him to a post and laid 39 lashes on his back till it ripped the, the muscle out of his back, laying open with blood where he couldn't even carry his cross when he was done. That was not for your sin. That was not for your peace. That was not for addiction. By his stripes, all of our infirmities, all of our diseases, and the more personal you make those verses, the more power you'll experience. When I read it, and I'm not preaching, I read, he bore Jonathan Shuttlesworth's sicknesses. He bore Jonathan Shuttlesworth's diseases. T.L. Osborne said, it's illegal for the devil to lay on you what was already laid on Christ Jesus. You say, then why are people sick then? Because my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If you think you have to put up with it the devil will give you more than you he's a thief thieves don't do what they're allowed to do thieves by nature do what they're not allowed to do but when you know the word of God you can say devil enough is enough 2,000 years ago my Savior had laid on him all of my infirmities all of my diseases and by his stripes I am healed What do you do when you don't know what to do? Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. Now, let me explain this to you. John 10.10. 10. Dr. Osborne called it the gospel in one verse. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. How can a minister have Jesus as the source of cancer? Find me one person in the Bible that was healthy that Jesus laid his hands on and made sick. From morning till night, they brought unto him all their sick that he might touch them. And whatever their sickness, whatever their disease, or if they were possessed by evil spirits, he healed them all. It's, un it's wicked to teach that God is the source. Of sickness and disease. I hate the song. He gives and takes away. I, I don't let it get sung in my meetings. So that's in the Bible. Yeah, Job said that. And then God came at the end of Job and rebuked Job for about every single thing that he said. Job said, the Lord hath given and the Lord hath taken away. He didn't know there was a devil. But the Bible doesn't say it was God that destroyed Job. The Bible says in Job 2.7, And Satan went forth and smote Job with boils. Acts 10.38, And no doubt you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing and healing, who were oppressed by. Satan is the oppressor. Jesus is the lifter of oppression.
Satan is the oppressor? Who's behind the heroin epidemic? Who's behind the teenage suicide epidemic? Who's behind children cutting their arms and legs until blood comes out? Who's behind the oppression that's on fathers and mothers and the tearing of parts of homes? Satan is behind oppression, but Jesus has given us power in the Holy Ghost to lift the oppression off of every man. Can you say amen? Can you say a better amen? amen? Don't get it confused. If you think God's the author of your to you, you're not going to fight. But if you understand, and this is where people get messed up, they think that everything that happens in life, well, I don't know why God allowed it. Turn to Matthew 18. If you'll let this get in your spirit, it'll change your Christian life. Matthew 18, verse 18. This is Jesus speaking to us as disciples. Matthew 18, 18. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you allow or permit on earth will be allowed and permitted by heaven. Whatever you, nobody uses, you know, this is King James English, where they were binding and loosing. Nobody binds anything. Nobody tells you when you're 16, you know, you, you mess up at home and your father says, I bind you from using the vehicle for the next month. So these, these words remain blind to people because we don't bind and loose. Those are 17th century legal terms. So the new translation says, that John said, whatever you permit on earth, I'll permit in heaven. And whatever you forbid on earth, I will forbid in heaven. God allows what you allow. How many people do, uh, see how weak they, see, if the devil wants you to think everything that happens in life is somehow in the will of God. Well, I don't know why God allowed it. What God allows has nothing to do with what God wants. Did God forbid Adam from eating the forbidden fruit? Did God, for, did God not allow, did God stop Adam from eating the forbidden fruit? No, he let him eat it. Did he want him to eat it? God allows what you allow. How many people does God want saved? Very good. The Lord is willing that none should perish. So is everybody saved? Why? Because the heavens, the psalmist said, that this is important doctrine. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to who? Man. Why do you think to redeem man, God couldn't just say, I forgive your sins. Someone had to come as a man and redeem mankind. That's why Jesus was made flesh. So one of the first heresies of the early church was that Jesus was a ghost and didn't leave any footprints. No, he was born in human flesh. For God to accomplish what he wants done on the earth, he ne in fact, I can tell you both ways. For Satan to do what he wants on the earth, he needs a man. Spirits can't pass legislation. Men under the influence of wicked spirits can pass legislation. Why are there people as driven as I am to preach the gospel, there's people that driven to produce pornography? It's all what spirits you're under the influence of. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say a better amen? amen? Satan needs men because the earth he's given to men. That's why Satan, the first thing he did was go to work getting Adam to come into agreement with him instead of God. Because until Satan gets you, how are you saved? If thou wilt believe in thy heart and confess with thy mouth, then you'll be saved. So as much as Satan wants everybody stolen from, killed, and destroyed, until he can get you, why do you think he always comes by fear? Why do you think in Second Chronicles? Did you ever notice? Why was it before every enemy ever attacked the children of God, they always sent word ahead? Who does that? Other than our country now, holds a press conference to announce we'll be launching a war tomorrow at 12.05. <laughs> you know, 
There is such a thing as surprise attack. Why does Satan always send word ahead? Why did messengers come and let Jehoshaphat know? There's these armies coming. Why? Because just like God works by faith, the devil works by fear. All, every attack of the devil starts by him allowing you to hear something that would terrify you. However, you hearing it doesn't do anything. Be not hearers of the word, but it's what you do once you hear it. And if you hear terrifying news and then believe it in your heart, and confess it with your mouth, you start giving life to what Satan wants to be a part of your life. That, when you hear that news, what you do with it from that point on determines whether it takes hold or whether it gets cast out. Satan works by fear. We found a lump. We found a problem in your son's brain. We found a problem with this. They're doing layoffs at the plant. You're one of the newest hires. You'll probably be one of the first ones to lose your job. So you want to know what most Christians do? That have been to church for 30 years, 40 years. They let that bad news come. They believe it in their heart. And they just repeat what everybody's told them. I've had people come up to me. Brother Jonathan, I heard people are getting healed. Not here yet. I hope I don't the rest of the time. Almost everywhere I go. Brother Jonathan, I've heard people are getting healed in these meetings. Then they'll just go on for like one minute, two minutes, three straight minutes. I, I, a doctor came, told me this. Then we had specialists run this test. Then they said, I, I, you know, I probably only have about six months. And I, I told the last one person that did it, it just it was, it was irritating me because she's a Christian. I said, what do you say? You know, the doctor said this, specialist. What do you say? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, ho I'm hoping isn't going to get it done. Hope isn't faith. Hope is believing God's going to do something. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, but faith is the confident assurance that we have whatsoever things we desire. Not we will have, we have. I'm not waiting on Jesus to heal me. What does he have to do? Leave heaven again and take special stripes for me? His sacrifice was enough for me. One of my prayer points to start this year that I've been praying every day. Father, in the midst of this generation that mocks people that believes your word, let my life be a testimony that you're able to keep all your promises to a man who believes it. Yeah, he, he gets a little overboard on that healing. See if people still think that when I'm 85 with no walking stick and preaching so strongly that if you're still alive, you'll lean over to your great grandkids and say, I saw him preach one time when he was 34. He was much more tame then. I don't know what got into him at 85. I made up my mind. If God's my healer, I'm not accepting sickness and disease. I don't care who says what. When my daughter, when my wife gave birth to my daughter at the hospital, we were walking out. They said, we'll see you again. I said, no, you won't. If I come to a hospital, it's to get somebody out. I'm not going there. God said, if you walk before me and be thou perfect, think of this. Exodus 15, the first way God revealed himself to the Hebrew children. drink for and now they're getting mad G Moses sees water the water of Mara which means bitter water they go to drink it it's full of bacteria the water is bitter God shows Moses a piece of wood which D.L. Moody said uh, Charles Spurgeon said is a type of the cross he picked up the wood threw it in the water when he did it cleared out every impurity every imperfection every bacteria all the virus and mess out of that water and the water became good to drink God used that as an object lesson he said children just as I cleared everything unclean out of that water I am the Jehovah Rapha the Lord that heals you walk before me and be thou perfect and I won't allow any of the diseases that came on the Egyptians to come on you. For I am the Lord your God who healeth thee. And I want you to know, all these years later, he is still the Lord God who's your healer. And he keeps sickness and disease out of your midst. If you believe it, go ahead. Let him know you believe him today. Shout, he's my healer. Notice, I don't have time to go into it. I have two and a half minutes. I could talk about Jesus all day. If you don't believe me, turn my radio station on. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. There's no sickness that can match up with the blood of Jesus. 
When the glory of God comes into a meeting, everything unclean has to go. Lift your hands all over this place. Whatever you walked in here with, I feel this so strong. Internally in your body, in your bloodstream, congenital problems you were born with. <laughs> Father, as I preach your word, without apology show that I'm not just running at the mouth that you are the same you said I'm the Lord God and I change not in the mighty name of Jesus every health problem that plagued you through 2014 I forbid it to cross over from 2014 into 2015 father we believe you're our healer we confess that you're our healer and so right now we receive the healing flow of Calvary I see a crimson stream of blood that flows from Calvary its waves that reach the throne of God are flowing over me flow over us right now God heal hernias heal ruptures heal muscle tears heal eyes heal ears let every unclean cell of cancer come out in Jesus name in the name of Jesus Christ stand up on your feet everybody so if you believe what the enemy says and confess it what does Proverbs say? Death and life are in the power of? God wants everybody to be saved. But before they can be saved, what do they have to do? What do you think? We have everybody come down here. And I have, say this. And I make it. And if they're not saying it, which everybody prayed it here. If I'm in New England, New Hampshire, New Brunswick, some place where people were born without personalities. Amen. Which isn't a problem here. Where they were taught to mumble in church. And I say, say this. Uh, uh, say, I believe you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I believe Jesus Christ is, Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says that by that confession, you're saved. So if I say that, say, I say Jesus Christ is Lord, and I hear. I say, I said, say. You know, either say it or go back to your seat. Because until you say it, you're not saved. You don't mumble it. By your... By your words will you be justified, and by your words will you be condemned. You can't sit around. You can come to these meetings two times a day till Jesus comes. If you're going to sit around a table with an AARP magazine and your same three sick old friends and compare illnesses and medications and talk about who has it worse, you're going to battle sickness till Jesus comes. But if you'll make up your mind today, no, I'm not going to believe the report of the enemy. I believe the word of God. And I'm not only going to believe it in my heart, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. I can't hold it in. I will declare the Lord is good. He is my rock. He is my salvation. The lifter of my head. He heals all my diseases and he forgives all my sin. Then you will walk in health all the days of your life. Go ahead. Give Jesus a mighty hand clap all over this place. This man here in the flannel button-up shirt or plaid, uh, step into the aisle if you would. I don't have time to pray for anybody else individually. Just lift your hands right there. As you do the power of God, you look healthy to look at you. But God's going to put his quickening power on your body right now. I command your strength to come back to your body like never before. Be healed in your body. In Jesus' name. As you believe the word of God, I also feel, not only now, but in the future, health problems that have run in your family, as you grow older, they will not touch you. You're going to start another line for your family. Your children and your grandchildren, should the Lord tarry, they're going to know what it's like to not take trips to the doctor, to not have to run. It ends with you, says the Lord. For as you believe my word, receive it now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody say this, it stops with me. Some of you grew up, everybody's always running to the doctor. Everybody's going to the high. Maybe I preach like this because my father made $5,800, not cleared 58, made gross income $5,800 his first year in full time ministry. So when I got sick, doctor was not an option. Unless there was a, a doctor left over from the 1800s that we could barter with, with green beans and honey glazed hams. My dad would put oil on my head, pray for me. Send me to bed. And when I woke up, the fever, I'd wake up in a cold sweat every time. When I went to get health insurance to get our daughter born, you know, I just got it the month before our daughter got pregnant and then canceled it after the baby was born. Amen. So the insurance companies, they say they mess people up 
but you can pull one over on them too. Praise the Lord. They ask you, who's your doctor? I had to give him my pediatrician. And the only reason I went to him was to get a physical to play ice hockey in Maine. Because we, you know, when you have to trust God, why are there miracles overseas? There's no option to go to the doctor. There's no, you prayed for me, I'm going to go get tested next week and we'll see what happens. No, they just, uh, thank you, I feel better, I know I'm healed. They don't have to run back and forth. The church, Jesus will either be everything or he'll be nothing at all. He won't be one of your many options for help. You have to commit thy way unto the Lord. And I'm telling you, from a family where we prayed, didn't have the money to go to a doctor. I don't have a testimony now. Well, my sister's dead and, you know, I'm not doing too well. We ne- no, Jesus is our healer. He said, I'm the great physician. I don't need help from any others. Thank God for doctors. I'm not against them. If it wasn't for doctors, 90% of the church would be dead. They don't know this stuff. But what are you going to do? You think Ebola is going to be the last disease that gets ready to slip through here? Jesus said, plagues and pestilences will abound. So God is trying in these meetings to get people's faith ready ahead of time. That when pestilence and plague and disease, that means incurable disease, plague, starts to sweep through America, there's places they can bring the sick. We're going to say, oh, can you sit them in a side room and court? No, bring them into the meeting. When we pour oil on their head, that thing's going to come out of their body just like it did for the last hundred people we did it for. Why do you think there's going to be such a great revival in this last days? Because when the world is out of money answers, when the world's out of health answers, when the world's out of answers for the depressed, there is going to be a house where people can come and find out that Jesus is still the answer for the world today, and we're going to be the vessels that give it to them. Lift your hands all over this place. From the top of thy head to the sole of thy feet, receive the healing power of Jesus Christ into your bodies now, into your pancreas now, into your kidneys now, in the name of Jesus, into your bloodstream, into your bones and joints. I command blood pressure to go back to where it's supposed to be supernaturally in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every arrow of the wicked that's launched against you, the shield of faith will quench it. It shall not harm you. In Jesus' name, you are blessed. You are not cursed. You are above. You are not beneath. Everywhere you go, be blessed in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you that as we meet again tonight, we will see the great workings of God in our generation. Thank you for these revival meetings. We give you praise for it, and we call it done. Shout this, I'm not like everybody else. else. I don't have to live like everybody else. else. Say, I am a child child. of the Most High God, God. and I am blessed. I am am healed. I am am delivered. I I am saved. In Jesus' name, clap your hands, everybody. God bless you. See you tonight at 7 o'clock. Have the best afternoon you've ever had in Jesus' name.